Welcome to today's webinar, Hospital Digital Experience, details from the latest study of 15 top-ranked hospitals' websites and takeaways you can apply at your organization. My name is Jane Weber Brubaker, and I'm the Executive Editor of Plain English Healthcare. We are the publishers of eHealthcare Strategy and Trends and Strategic Healthcare Marketing and the producers of the eHealthcare Leadership Awards, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. As an industry, healthcare is working diligently to design better digital experiences. In today's presentation, we'll share highlights from Connective DX's latest hospital digital experience index. This research evaluates top-ranked top healthcare organizations and establishes industry baselines for digital experiences. Our presenters will give you an expert tour of the best digital work happening among leading organizations like Johns Hopkins, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, and others. And now I'd like to introduce our presenters for today's event. Dave Winicky is the lead strategist, digital experience thought leader, and advisor across Connective DX's health enterprise clients. He is the author and lead researcher of the Hospital Digital Index Reports. Dave joined Connective DX in 2009, establishing its digital strategy and consulting practice, where he partnered with digital change agents in fast transforming industries. During this time, he taught digital marketing and customer-centered management at Northeastern University and Rutgers Business School. Aaron Watkins leads the internet strategy team in the creation and execution of a comprehensive online strategy, including content creation and development, user-centered design and development, internet marketing and social engagement, and data-driven performance analysis. The Johns Hopkins Medicine website is the third most visited hospital or academic medical, web, medical center web property in the world. Today's presentation will be approximately 45 minutes, followed by a 15-minute Q&A. To submit questions, type them into the control panel and click send. We'll hold questions until the end, but please feel free to submit them at any time. Today's session is being recorded. At the conclusion of the webinar, we'll send an email to all attendees with a link to the presentation slides, as well as a link to download the full Hospital Digital Experience Index report. You'll receive a link to access the webinar recording as soon as it's been processed and it's available for viewing. And now I'd like to turn it over to our first presenter, Dave Winicky from Connective DX. Dave, take it away. Jane, thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, I think Jane had said this is the uh, third edition of what's become a pretty deep dive on the state of digital among this set of really well-regarded clinical teams. Uh, copies of the report are being made available to everyone on the call today. I know that they'll be uh, sent out after the presentation. Uh, you may or may not have seen the full 80 pages of the report, but take my word, uh, as the researcher and author, there's more in it than just the things we're featuring here today. These are maybe the most uh, provocative takeaways uh, for people who are leading change, uh, like you at hospitals and uh, organizations that serve healthcare across the country. So as fellow change agents, you already know that real change is really hard. But this research shows that it's happening in real time because real people in real ways are really working at it. And that's why I'm so happy to have Aaron Watkins from Johns Hopkins Medicine uh, with us today, and we'll be stopping at two different points uh, where we'll just talk about uh, the research and the good work that's going on uh, there at Johns Hopkins Medicine. Uh, our research does show that they're a top five leader in market impact. Jane had mentioned third most visited hospital web property in the world. And they're topping the metric that we believe is perhaps the best indicator of performance by digital teams. So we'll have lots to talk about uh, with him from their brand identity to how they've invested themselves in to some long-term efforts that are really paying off. So um, that is where we're going. If you're familiar with the research, you know that it breaks down into uh, quadrants. I will just move straight forward to that. Uh, I, I'd like to think that each of these quadrants has something for everyone. Uh, for people who are brand managers, obviously the brand strength that focuses on clarity is important. Uh, for technologists and developers looking at functional capability, 
for user experience professionals, our use cases, which this year expanded significantly, and for people who are content marketers, looking at the actual in-market impact of these 15 systems. And I want to point out that all 15 of these systems are world-class organizations. They have uh, innovation in their DNA. And so what we're going to be doing is looking across them for great examples uh, of digital experience. What you see in front of you are these four quadrants we just talked about with the items that we score that create composite scores for each of these quadrants. There also are as many areas that we observe but do not score, and we archive that information so we can refer to it directionally in future research. Uh, I would also note that we're in the process of putting a curriculum together to help uh, hospitals and individuals uh, do this themselves end to end. So more on that in coming months. So, while you can apply this to any health system, and in fact, we apply this even in other industries, uh, for this public report, we focus on the top 15 clinically ranked systems by U.S. News. And the purpose of using U.S. News is just to externalize that selection. Uh, every list has a selection bias. Looking to U.S. News at least uh, bases our research on a, a well-known list, uh, so I'm not introducing new personal bias. And at the same time, this is a legitimately very esteemed group of clinical organizations. And that may mean that they carry some additional cachet as their examples are taken to other clinical organizations. So this is the who we look at. We've talked a little bit about what we look at. Uh, these are the findings. And uh, I think that the least valuable way to use this research is as a horse race, the insights really are more uh, valuable than scoring things out. But it's interesting how things break into deciles. Uh, there are two Midwestern healthcare publishers who you'd expect to see in the top decile, uh, West Coast innovators uh, in the 70s, uh, Northern Midwest challengers in the 60s, and then the rest of these organizations pretty much fall into the same 10 or 11 point range. And again, all are world-class leaders. Every one of them have best practices that we've taken away from. Uh, but this is a good way to get an aggregate view of our industry, to spot innovation and emerging best practices, and over years, measure some real progress. So let's jump in. Uh, two of the biggest surprises that uh, came out of this year's research uh, were in the area of brand clarity. And as we take on each of these quarters, you'll see up in the top left listed the kinds of things that we look at overall for that quarter. Um, but in this case, uh, there was uh, an unexpected result, and it was something we never thought that we'd be studying. Uh, as we reviewed the brands of the top 15 clinical organizations, uh, we found that uh, the presence of women in hero images and the presence of African Americans in the hospital hero images had dramatically expanded. And uh, I didn't want to just come to you with you know, some observations about that, but we've had conversations with these brands and have developed a, a little bit of uh, knowledge about how this came to be. So uh, I'll share that with you. But last year, if uh, we had thought uh, to distill the images of women on uh, the top 15 hospital websites. Uh, these would have been the non-clinical women, and these would have been the clinical ones. And you can see there's kind of this repeated otoscope uh, meme uh, of a woman doctor looking in someone's ear. Uh, probably three of these uh, look like clip art to many of you, uh, but not Lisa Latanza. She's the uh, surgical chief for hand and elbow at UCSF. And uh, she was the one uh, woman provider who was uh, referred to by name. So that was uh, the, the women providers from last year. And again, we weren't looking for this, but see if you notice the difference in quantity and quality. This is what this year's images looked like. And you know, wow, more than any single finding, 
just the evidence that there's this kind of change that happened across virtually all 15 systems is a signal that change is possible even in prestigious systems, you know, even when there isn't perhaps a clear starting pistol being fired. Uh, I'd be very interested if you've seen this change in your brand. I know we'll talk with Aaron some about this. Uh, and I've had the chance to talk with chief diversity officers and brand managers. So this is a, a representation of how dramatically uh, just a doubling of women on web pages uh, has been. Uh, there was a four and a half time increase in the presence of African Americans this year. And uh, rather than uh, distilling them into a composite. I just want to look through uh, a number of these top 15 sites and I'll comment on them, see if you uh, start to see uh, a trend started. Uh, here on Barnes Jewish, uh, they have a carousel. So their carousel shows five images, one of which is the Women's Health Center. And this is a little bit of a micro trend, uh, recognizing the importance of women buyers in health care. And you can see, you know, that's featured as well as uh, uh, greater diversity. Uh, on John Hopkins, uh, you can see a continuance of that theme. Also, a women's health center over on the right. And a balance of growing to serve the world up on top uh, to, on the bottom, a commitment to bringing that expertise back home. And other Industries that we serve have globally local brands, and people like Johns Hopkins, UPMC, MGH, Mayo Clinic are all navigating this trek into becoming globally and local at once, and digital is certainly an enabler of that. At Cedar sinai you can see uh, bringing the brand local and uh, outreach through barbershops, so interesting way of grounding that to a local brand here at uh, Mass General here in Boston, uh, featuring again, uh, very prominently, uh, the work of women providers. We see this uh, even in the incidental art, uh, down at the bottom on Cleveland Clinic, talking about their partnership with Oscar Healthcare. We believe we may see a, you know, a woman there, we see diversity even in uh, telemedicine. So there's just a theme that builds up. Uh, New York Presbyterian takes a big step away from clip art with otoscopes to uh, rotating uh, randomized images of very real people uh, and their stories at New York Presbyterian. And uh, you see this across Mayo sites and uh, most importantly in their uh, HR recruiting where uh, diversity and projecting diversity is extremely important. Uh, to the type of medical school graduates particularly uh, that these uh, systems are pursuing. So you can see this theme again and again. It really was across all 15 of the systems. And to make sense of this, uh, I talked with some of the brand and diversity leaders uh, featured in the report. And there were two themes that came out of our conversation. The first is that diversity isn't what it used to be. Uh, the generations that today lead great healthcare organizations, what they would have considered diversity when they were starting out is very different, as I mentioned, what uh, new recruits would be looking for. Secondly, uh, patient and family advisory committees are really voicing the need uh, for the uh, hospital, who often is among the largest employers in the community, to really build a healthy culture and to allow people to see themselves uh, in the care and in the professional roles that happen there. So uh, we learned uh, that diversity is an increasingly important part of brands. And uh, while that may or may not happen all in one step, uh, it's the type of thing that now we're sensitized to and are watching for uh, as we go into the next year's research. This uh, drive towards diversity also surprised us in that it takes the form of increased multilingualism. And we had watched for this in previous years uh, where there had been one system uh, that was doing multilingual translation. And in this year, that jumped from one to four. University of Colorado, Cedar sinai UCLA, and Mayo Clinic, who's pictured here. Mayo is likely the most ambitious uh, of those four as they're doing hybrid translation across their site. 
And as we talk to other large systems besides these four, uh, multilingualism is being elevated uh, as a priority, not just for uh, visiting patients internationally, but increasingly for domestic audiences as well. And this is a potential multi-year theme that we see, at least this year, uh, a pretty big change in. Inside of Mayo, we can see both uh, language that is written uh, in language, such as grand rounds in Spanish, uh, but there's also machine translation going on for things like medical resource pages or condition pages. Uh, the shift apparent through some of the staffing going on in these large systems, they're increasingly hiring uh, people who can work uh, in multilingual content. And uh, we're seeing pieces of it uh, across a number of sites. Again, here's New York Presbyterian. Uh, they make resources available for people coming to their sites, available in multiple languages. And uh, they also have a multilingual interface uh, coming into uh, their patient uh, portal. So it's a very big, potentially multi-year uh, change that we see happening uh, as we go from one to four systems doing translation. So that could be a very big uh, shift of work. What I'd like to do is uh, bring my friend Aaron in, and I'll further introduce Aaron not only as the leader of a great digital team, uh, but also a digital team that's helped us try to make this research more useful uh, to people leading brands. And uh, Aaron, just from what you've seen, is, uh, is this raising themes that are familiar to, to you and your team? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, uh, first off, it's good to be kind of recognized in this category. Um, for us, um, yeah, as an institution, it's really uh, one of our core values. Um, our very first medical class actually included three women, um, and that's something that our leaders are very proud of, and we continue to kind of have programs that continue to position women leaders and, and diverse leaders uh, in our organization and in healthcare. Um, and there's constant reminders for us of how important this is to our culture and to our city and, and the country and the world. So, so yeah. Um, you know, I mean, one thing I could remark on too, I mean, it, um, if you look at our website today, you can see our banners. We actually just rolled out some kind of um, video banners on our homepage recently. Um, and for us, when we think about the imagery uh, in those, um, you know, it's not just about the ethnicity. Uh, we're thinking about gender, age, um, varying socioeconomic status, um, diversity, both in the staff that we show and the patients. And we really want to make sure our website reflects the community around Hopkins. Um, you know, and beyond that, I think in our content strategy, and probably I think this is Probably the most important thing for our team to make sure that it's not just about community, communicating institutional messages or setting a perception, but how can we create content that is really helpful and, and meaningful to diverse communities. And so, um, you know, as examples in our health content strategy, um, we develop content for specific audiences. So. Um, we've produced content for millennial women um, about um, the links between heart disease and depression, um, health problems that they might not realize they're not too young for, things like high blood pressure, diabetes, strokes um, that can affect um, especially female millennials um, and others. Um, we create a good bit of content for African American um, off, uh, audiences as well um, about mental health, hair loss um, among black women, um, things that we have experts who are either studying or see as consistent trends in their, um, you know, in their treatment centers. Um, and also, I think I should say we're really proud of the work that Hopkins is doing with the transgender community. And as a result, we have a trans, uh, transgender health center um, we produce a great deal of content to help guide people on whether they need that kind of surgery, whether it's the right time for them to make that decision, um, tips for parents who have LGBTQ youth, um, content that we just really feel people can use whether they come to Hopkins or not. 
Karen, in previous years, we've uh, seen particularly Hopkins making effort around uh, readability and a shift towards more accessible language. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything you'd want to share about uh, that long-term journey? Sure. I mean, this is, so we work closely with our patient education group on kind of establishing um, readability levels. I mean, of course, it's a bit of a challenge in healthcare. Um, you know, you're, you're using big words to begin with. Um, often in our work, um, we're, we're, we're trying to communicate a scientific perspective on care as well. And so sometimes um, our faculty are coming with kind of really big ideas and language. And so, you know, we're constantly assessing um, the work and, um, you know, using evaluation tools, um, looking for opportunities, yeah, to use maybe the big words, but to make sure that um, we have um, simple language as much as possible uh, on the site. And um, I think it, it's an area where I think we just continue to get better and better in our content approach. Yeah, there's a real frustration that can happen when people feel like they're not a good enough patient mm -hmm. uh, or that they're not getting something that they should. Uh, so that's really this interesting brand intersection between usability uh, and brand, uh, brand clarity and positioning. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. So uh, what I'd like to do is I'll turn back, uh, if I can, to uh, another long-term journey uh, that's been going on. And uh, Aaron, please you know, comment in here as you like. Okay. Uh, for the last number of years, uh, these large systems have been uh, working on uh, becoming mobile first. And at this point, uh, essentially all the systems have accomplished uh, responsive design. And to some degree, mobile is table stakes for telehealth. And that's one of the enablers of you know, people being able to uh, engage in care is being able to engage in it across platforms. So we're seeing uh, increased uh, adoption from people like Barnes here in using telehealth as an infrastructure. And uh, in the case of Barnes, they're using it doing uh, business to business, uh, providing their uh, ICU uh, and stroke programs to other hospitals, uh, as well as uh, differentiating uh, their women's health program in the way they use telemedicine and fertility treatment. So there are a lot of different payoffs that are happening, uh, but across these brands, uh, we see uh, people commercializing telehealth uh, in ways that explain to patients why this might be a good thing for them. Uh, do you want to comment in uh, any, if you like, Aaron, on how you see telehealth uh, unfolding uh, there at Johns Hopkins? Well, I mean, it's massive. I think, um, you know, we're in the midst of um, a digital transformation plan here. Um, and a big part of that effort is to align our web efforts with those of our telehealth, um, I'll say teams, right? Because a lot of this kind of innovation is happening um, among researchers and faculty and corporate interests all around us. And so um, I'd say for us, the biggest change is we're trying to present it more holistically and um, really present, you know, more leadership uh, from Hopkins as a whole in telehealth. Um, we're doing a lot of great innovation um, and need to make sure that that it's reaching as many people as possible. And and I suspect that's true of a lot of healthcare systems who are, are developing things and trying to roll them out to the public. It's interesting. It feels like we're seeing a level of engagement that's considerably deeper than just a year or two ago when we talked about omni-channel communications, that people might connect in social media or they might connect by chat bot. And now the idea is that you know, our patients will have logged in experiences and potentially uh, have these intimate encounters with clinicians yeah. uh, is, is a deeper brand experience than, you know, I think what we were talking about a few years ago. Yeah. One of the things that I've seen that's been a, a kind of a surprise is that several of uh, these large brands 
have called out the telephone as being a channel for engagement uh, that comes before other things like fill out a form or chat with us now. And in the case of Penn and Mayo, they explicitly say for faster assistance or the best way to contact us uh, is to stop self-service if you're willing to and uh, to engage someone directly on the phone uh, in planning care. And, uh, you know, certainly, uh, I don't know if you have a, a story that you want to weigh in on there, but it's uh, significant to me to see these two systems really elevating uh, the telephone as a way of shifting that digital experience from self-serve into uh, them interacting with the prospective patients. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... It, we're very much in the same boat. I really like the language that they're using on their site. Um, you know, it, a thing that is kind of a driving principle for us is that the web ultimately needs to set the stage for what will happen for people kind of in their real world firsthand experience with Hopkins. It's, you know, it's a doorway. Um, and so the web needs to set the stage, you know, and make the promise that ultimately that first person that picks up the phone can deliver on. Um, and we've seen in studies that if we haven't done that appropriately, or if people have that first bad kind of human touch point um, with, you know, with Hopkins or with any hospital, um, that they'll probably go away. <laughs> you know, they'll probably go uh, elsewhere if they can. And so, yeah, a lot of our work on the web is we're trying to align with the operational facets of the organization and, and make sure that first human contact is a good one. Yeah, it really is essential to get some of these fundamentals rock solid, whether it's having a telephone contact center uh, that's able to provide that good first experience uh, one of the things I was surprised to find is an actual attractive contact us form uh, mm -hmm. on Cedar Spy and I. And, you know, there is no budget holder for the contact us form, uh, but that is kind of the, uh, the patient access commons. Uh, so something as simple as organizing the best way to route contacts to the hospital uh, really impressed me that this is something that a lot of systems uh, could dial in more than they have today. Um, I was at uh, HIMSS this spring and Preston Gee from Christus uh, talked about primary research they had done that said, not surprisingly, the first thing a patient wants to know when they're searching for a doctor is, will they take my insurance? But looking across these top 15 systems, only three out of the 15 allow people to search based on insurance taken. So it feels like there really are some important relationship handholds that, you know, while it feels like we've made a lot of progress over the last few years, that there really are some important uh, touch points uh, that we could uh, work to make, uh, you know, doctor finding far more useful in and uh, make it easier for people to engage with the brands. Yeah, definitely. This is a problem we're trying to tackle right now um, as well. And, and sometimes something I'm trying to kind of communicate internally, there's a lot of complications with insurance, especially at a doctor level where, you know, the insurance coverage is changing so rapidly that it's hard to keep the web up to date. Um, and in fact, we do have services here at the hospital, again, with a phone call where someone can maybe guide you towards appropriate insurance or the questions to ask your insurance company um, to see if they might cover it, even if it's normally outside of your coverage. You know, insurance companies have partnerships um, to have people travel across state for care as examples. And um, so we've been having a lot of meetings and I'm, I'm trying to, um, create content that can help guide people on the kinds of questions that they should be asking and also the kinds of services that they can get here to make better decisions. Yeah, uh, I think we're beginning to recognize that our patients live in a hybrid digital world mm -hmm. and all of our interactions, whether they're online or in person, are gonna be some mix of both of those mediums. 
So in use cases, I just want to focus on uh, one emerging pattern that was important to us. And that's the idea that new patients may need an experience different than returning patients. And this is particularly important in a meaningful use era when we want our returning patients to increasingly use patient portals and self-service in an authenticated state rather than being treated like a brand new patient. So this interface uh, is from MGH. And you can see new patients, existing patients, referring providers. Those are kind of the three tracks. And what was interesting is just as we went through sites, uh, we found a number uh, of sites basically beginning to split new and returning patients for different experiences. And even in Stanford, which isn't quite organized the same way, uh, they start off saying, request an appointment directly with your clinic or doctor. Okay, that would be a returning patient because I know my clinic or doctor uh, versus why would I choose this brand or how would I become a patient? Uh, so it's interesting that we're seeing this channeling uh, that provides a richer brand experience, like on, on Stanford here, uh, for new patients, and then a log on and uh, serve yourself in an authenticated way for returning patients. So there are two different finish lines, and I know a lot of digital teams don't measure their success by getting people to sign on to the portal and do their transaction there, but that seems to me like that's an increasing, uh, increasingly important finish line uh, for, for people on the website. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny, we're talking about this. So again, part of our digital transformation, I feel a lot of web teams and healthcare systems are challenged by limits of the technology they have in place. Um, you know, we're not, that different. Most of our investments happen at a department level before, before they happen at an enterprise level. Um, but we're starting to look at opportunities where if we really have best in class uh, enterprise, you know, CMS or user experience platform, um, a CRM and ties in with Epic and MyChart, but actually our web team, we can be well positioned to identify people who might not have signed in to my chart, who, uh, you know, may have an upcoming appointment or information right. to help them post appointment, right? And we can personalize the calls to action to them through that. And there's a lot of really effective use cases that um, would be, that are huge opportunities um, for us. Um, as we get these technologies in place at the enterprise. Um, you know, and I think the opportunity for health systems, so I think we've all, we all think about protecting data, um, but we're starting to have better conversations about using data and building trust with people by using that data at points when they need it. And it's, it's opportunities like this where I, I think we could make a big difference. Yeah, and the integration of the experience systems really make for a smoother experience than selecting care. And then once you selected care, it's like we've never seen you before. And right. uh, you have to reintroduce yourself in every encounter. Mm -hmm. uh, just in passing, again, uh, Barnes is doing an interesting thing here by having two different phone numbers even uh, for new or returning patients. As you suggest, Aaron, it'd be entirely possible to recognize uh, a yep. group of returning patients and just starting to personalize a message like that. Mm -hmm. So final section, market impact will be interesting to talk with you about because uh, Hopkins is a leader in market impact. Uh, you, one thing just in passing is uh, you can see in the bottom left uh, how important organic traffic is in our industry that between people directly visiting sites and the organic search traffic that comes, uh, that's by far the lion's share of people showing up to hospital websites. Very little of it is paid. Uh, social and email bring some people back to the sites. Uh, but by far, the biggest contributor is, is organic search. And uh, you know, when we look across these sites, uh, there are a couple very big publishers uh, who way over-index in attracting 
uh, healthcare publishing traffic from around the, the world. Uh, but when you break that down uh, into non-branded search, and we are coming to believe that non-branded search is uh, an important way of thinking about digital teams and what they add. Uh, because if you're part of a very famous brand, it's not the digital team that's bringing the traffic there, it's uh, the brand equity of the system. Uh, but often it's the non-branded visitors who are really deciding which care do they want to consider. And uh, when you look at that, you still see uh, the big uh, publishers, but you also see this class of what I think are more EDU or academic medical center uh, focused uh, hospitals like Michigan and Hopkins. Uh, so. As we talk about this, I'd love uh, any thoughts that you have of the way that your team has uh, put messages out that go beyond uh, the already strong brand, uh, you know, the Johns Hopkins Medicine is yours. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, really, I view this as one of the most important things our team does. Um, when I got here 10 years ago, Hopkins wasn't really performing that well on search. Um, we didn't have a cohesive strategy. Um, and, you know, right around 2009, we launched a centralized health library, just an A to Z, that started to, to address that. Um, and so we've been really plugging away at this for 10 years. Um, you know, for us, it's been one, you know, really developing custom Hopkins content um, but taking a really, just, it's almost like doing your push-ups and taking your vitamins, like taking a real basic approach to it, like making sure that we've got appropriate schema on the pages, canonical tagging, we build content hubs for, um, you know, content areas that, that we know we want, we can either gain a lot of traction in, or it really serves a business purpose. Um, you know, we think about accessibility and how it relates to SEO and things like video transcripts and how we title things. Um, so it's just, it's kind of, it's a big part of what we do. Um, and it, I, I won't say that all our investments go toward it, but it's always been kind of a core area where um, we have a great tool set to analyze how we're performing and where we have opportunities. And then we've, I've, I've also, I'm sorry, Dave, were you going to jump in? I was going to say it's exciting to see that kind of long-term effort pay off. One yeah. of the areas that I know teams focus on this way uh, are around uh, the names of their providers, mm -hmm. making sure uh -huh. the provider search finds its way to the hospital website. Is, is that something uh, that, that's a, currently a factor, that has been a factor in your journey? We do, yeah, and it's funny. So we ha also have a, a rule here um, regarding our licensing that we have to present um, the titles of our physicians, uh, meaning in the you know H1 tag, the way it presents on their medical license, which isn't always necessarily the title that they practice under. Um, and so that's one of our kind of unique challenges in that we we have what we call the vanity URL that physicians can change the URL for their profile. They can enter their custom name, which appears um, as an H2 then under the H1. Um, so, you know, we've got little quirks in it like that. Um, you know, but more importantly, yeah, this is, it's an area where, again, we, we dedicated resources um, years ago to really centralizing our profiles, developing a great deal of content on those profiles. Um, and it's actually an area we're revisiting, hoping to launch new profiles in about a year. Lots well, of videos and things great. like that too. Sorry. Sure. Lots of videos. Uh, before, yeah. before we turn towards questions, which I promise everyone mm -hmm. tuned in is coming up, that might be a good opportunity to comment on this balance between centralizing assets, which often take capital purchases and long-term plans, mm -hmm. and serving uh, service lines that kind of challenges to be agile. 
Um, mm -hmm. how, how are you guys uh, negotiating that balance to, to satisfy both? Right. So I think there's always, there's a bit of an ebb and flow to it. Um, you know, the, like, like you said, there's that balance of making the good capital investments so you can really build centralized content that serves people. And we've done that with health content really effectively. Um, and we've done it that in ways that it's enabled us to adapt and evolve that content and, you know, also demonstrate the value internally to faculty physicians who essentially participate in creating that content. Um, you know, we've made some compromises. Um, we have what's called conditions we treat pages on our service line sites that are kind of pared down versions of the centralized health content. Um, you know, and what it's things like that, they, they've kind of served their purpose. They helped us to navigate to where we are today. Um, we're also seeing that, oh, we could, we could approach the content a little better and a little differently today based on the kind of visitor patterns we're seeing on the website, right? So, um, so you know, the short answer is there's always an ebb and a flow and, I don't know, a willingness um, on the part of everyone involved to, to compromise and try some new things to find out what, what works and what doesn't. Super. So what I'd like to do is I recognize that we have uh, both a number of hospitals that are in this report tuned in today. Uh, and also several hundred uh, people who've called in to participate. Uh, Jane, let me turn back your way and uh, see if there are some questions that have queued up uh, that Aaron and I might address. Okay, uh, that sounds great. That's great information, you two. Really good conversation. Um, so let's go back to the section on um, the multilingual websites and um, one of the a couple of questions came in about that, um, asking, is it done by machine or is it done manually? Um, how does the translation actually happen in most cases? And um, part two of that question is, are those pages getting traffic? Uh, two of the sites are being done by Google Translate. One is being done by Microsoft Translate. And uh, the fourth, which is Mayo, is a hybrid of machine and original in-language authorship. And uh, you know, we expect uh, to, to continue to see that balance between machine and original authorship shift. And uh, in talking with several other large systems, uh, they have initiatives that aren't yet on their pages. Uh, that are starting to address the need for multilingual also. Mm -hmm. So uh, machine is still uh, in the lead, uh, but we're beginning to see uh, people uh, custom developing images and writing uh, unique to the cultures uh, of these other languages. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, if I, if I could add for us here, so we have a very, I'll say, small amount of content that's been translated. Uh, we have um, five foreign language subsites. Um, they're mainly focused on helping international people or people who speak foreign languages you know, access the system and understand services. Um, part of the reason is we really have focused that we've used translation services for our content. And as an organization, we've been reluctant to to do the machine translation. Um, I think that'll change at some point and it'll open up, you know, the investment and the opportunity for us in providing more health content and, and other content in foreign languages. Maybe machine yeah, learning. I, I could imagine uh, health systems uh, moving towards multilingualism in response to a first or a second mover. So others might demonstrate the safety or the, uh, uh, the benefit of that move, uh, and others may wait and, and to see that get proved out by a peer before they take that step themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so um, do you, is John Hopkins Medicine testing chatbots for a hybrid human touch point? Um, so I, 
I would say behind the scenes, we're looking at it. Um, it's definitely something we're very interested in doing. Um, you know, we're looking at some vendors who are providing it. Um, you know, so yeah, I anticipate it. I think, um, I mean, earlier in the um, session, I mentioned this kind of larger digital transformation that we're going through. And, you know, there, there have been groups that have wanted to pilot that on a very small scale. Um, I think for us as an institution, we're just getting to a new point where some of those groups were all kind of coming together and deciding where is best to do it and how can we support it um, and taking a collective kind of enterprise view of it. And uh, yeah, I anticipate from that, like we're probably about a year away from it. Um, I think it's definitely critical the, and just like making sure the web sets the tone for the phone experience, we want to make sure that the chat bot is really truly tied into the, the operational aspect that we're going to put it out there to support. Okay. One of the uh, really provocative uses of chatbot uh, that I've heard about over the last year is from uh, the Geisinger Health System in Central PA, mm -hmm. uh, which is using that clinically uh, in communities where diagnosis can be very difficult. And clinicians uh, act uh, to check each other and ask each other questions uh, around differential diagnosis. And there's an AI agent using chatbot learning to ask questions about diagnosis like a colleague specialist. Uh, so in this case, it's a clinical use of chatbot uh, and it's simulating what are the kinds of questions that a fellow diagnostician would uh, ask uh, in making a certain kind of difficult diagnosis. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's interesting to see these tools that marketing may be debuting first, uh, finding, uh, finding their way deep into the organization into ways that are uh, you know, clinically uh, useful as tools. That is awesome. Okay, great. And would you say that, um, here's another question that came in. Are hospitals following the retail world and tracking online to offline customer journeys at all or making correlations to track ROI? Hmm. Well, uh, increasingly, I know that marketing directors are focusing in on which ICD-10 uh, treatments uh, are their marginal drivers of revenue, and that's pushing development and media spends. Uh, I also see some systems that are beginning to uh, augment the visit data they get uh, with the type of other system data from visiting other websites that you might see in e-commerce. So realizing what other hospitals uh, a visitor has been to or what other condition searches they've done before they arrive to your site Mm -hmm. is the kind of data that some systems are appending uh, to, to better personalize uh, those visits. So that's an area where e-commerce definitely um, has stepped up. Um, but I think that e-commerce shopping is still tremendously different from the selection of care. Okay. Um, we have another question here in regard to accessibility issues and ADA compliance. Um, have you taken any measures regarding accessibility or have a plan for incorporating such measures? Uh, on behalf of the research, the answer is yes and yes. Uh, we see 508 compliance being increasingly important. And while there hasn't been uh, a really relevant uh, measure uh, that can separate kind of the wheat from the chaff or the best from the not quite best, uh, we see this as being so important to systems uh, that we know that's something that is going to have to become a scored element uh, in our next iteration. And uh, Aaron, do you want to comment uh, on the rise of 508 compliance? Uh, yeah. You know, from your perspective. Yeah, sure, happy to. Yeah, I mean, I I think of it still as a pretty foundational component to how you approach the web, how you code. 
um, you know, how you put your content out, um, you know, so just like we, you know, have a, have a process where we're assessing SEO as we create content and um, we're looking at, you know, our videos and how are those uh, compliant. Um, yeah, we're, we're trying to make sure that we um, are meeting that standard. So we, we strive for a, a level two um, standard on our site. Um, you know, we also do, you know, we're realistic. There are times when we can't hit it, that we might need to push something out quickly um, that is either maybe newly developed um, or it's a type of interactive that we haven't produced before. And so you can find things like that on our site. Um, what we strive to do is, is circle back on them and decide, well, is this something that we want to kind of, um, you know, um, have a regular process to build and how will we make it accessible in those cases? Or is this kind of a one-off and can we just throw, you know, some kind of alternate form of that, um, you know, that interactive component? Um, can we put something else to replace it um, for people who need it? So, um, yeah, I mean, I do, I tend to view it more as a foundational thing that you need to put into practice if you're going to achieve. Great, thanks for that clarification. Um, we do have a question going back to the diversity section. In the full report, there's a pull quote referencing the My Diversity Story program. And could you please elaborate what this program is? Erin, I'm not sure if you're familiar with my, the My Diversity program, but that came from an interview that in fact I had done uh, at John Hopkins. And uh, it built off of uh, Aaron's earlier comments uh, that there are stories of diversity that exist in the organization, but that they're not always clear when you walk through the front door. And often what you may see are historic board members or you know, less diverse visions of the past, uh, which kind of paint the storied history of these brands. And uh, you know, beyond John Hopkins, uh, any number of these brands uh, go way back and are innovators and have these diversity stories that are now being brought to the fore. And, uh, you know, Aaron, you can comment on what you've seen, uh, but in my uh, interview, uh, John Hopkins had made a, a very active uh, investment, and we talked about that in the print uh, edition, uh, mm -hmm. to tell those stories so that people knew that that was part of the uh, heritage and that they, you know, could see themselves uh, in the past as well as the present. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, I, um, I don't think I could capture it as well as their diversity team, but like I said, it's, it's definitely something that is referenced so frequently by our leaders in so many different ways. Um, you know, so, um, you know, we've had females as part of the School of Medicine from its start in the late 1800s and are really proud of that. You see that demonstrated everywhere. Um, we've got a women in executive leadership program. Um, on our website, you can find timelines that um, demonstrate um, every female faculty person who um, has ever um, you know, been on faculty. Um, there's a lot of efforts like that. Um, our leadership too, they tend to speak to us in times of kind of national crisis more and more, such as the shooting at the synagogue in Pittsburgh. We had messages um, from our, our dean uh, and our health system president, um, you know, letting us know if we were affected in some way to reach out, letting us know to be cognizant that we may have patients that are, you know, indirectly or directly affected. And, um, you know, just those kind of constant reminders of that value. Um, and I know our diversity team, like they on their website have really focused on what's the, the makeup of the student body, our leadership, um, these different um, aspects of the institution and how is that shifting, evolving, where does it need to be improved? You know, we try and be really transparent about that and share um, stories that are relevant um, to those as they happen. Okay, great, thanks. 
Yeah. Um, another participant is asking um, on a different topic, are you segmenting audience by new and current patients when you're sending all paid advertising in your CRM? Dave, would you want to talk about what you're seeing in others? Is that something you looked at in the study? Uh, yeah, we're beginning to see early adopters looking for flags of people who use patient portal uh, or who've done other things that would indicate that there are returning patients. Uh, and the elevation of log on uh, as a, a primary call to action. And this isn't a best practice yet. It's uh, kind of an experimental good one. Uh, but uh, we see structurally, uh, you know, these two uh, pathways, renew and returning. And uh, we are beginning to see systems picking up the flags that would uh, allow them to illuminate the right runway uh, for someone who they know is a returning patient. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I'd say on a small scale, we're doing it here at Hopkins, but we have a ways to go. Um, and I'd also add like, I'm kind of more interested, not just in kind of that identification, but um, really customizing calls to action as much as we possibly can. So rather than producing pages that may have, you know, several options and things for people to sort through, where can we leverage the CRM to put a custom call to action or a custom article, whatever it is, you know, custom content in front of people. So just the experience is very clean and cohesive. And we're a ways from doing it, but um, you know, I feel like that's ultimately where the leaders will be headed. Yeah, and this kind of interaction, uh, while it will happen to some degree on the public website, will more and more happen in these authenticated uh, and secure uh, mm -hmm. private interactions through the portals. So there are health concerns that will last people's lifetimes and that you know, really spans beyond intermittent care. And the idea that content that's germane to that stage of your care journey would show up in uh, the care portal uh, is the kind of engagement that's both clinical, but it's also a, a very positive brand experience. So uh, you know, I would imagine in future years, uh, we would hope to uh, be able to show uh, some of the good things happening in authenticated sessions, which are going to become, you know, how the brand gets lived more and more by patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. Great. Just a few more questions here. Um, to, to create your health library, did you use a licensed system like mm -hmm. Stay Well, or did your team create, write, and edit content for the myriad conditions and treatments? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, great question. So we did in 2009 we introduced licensed content as the foundation for the library. Um, and we have since, you know, we've built off that. So uh, we still have licensed content, um, but today the vast majority, so it is, um, um, is custom to Hopkins. Um, I think, I forget the exact numbers, but I think when we went live, we had like 800 licensed pages Today, we have like five to 600 that are still licensed. And then we have about 3,000 in our central health library that are, um, you know, that are entirely custom and, and take broader views than just A to Z type content. So I really recommend it as a foundation, but I'd say think through the reasons. Like what made ours work was, yeah, we knew the content was solid. Um, but additionally, we put a lot of energy into building a good taxonomy around that content. And that taxonomy actually became the navigation for the site as a whole. So that became how you could get to the right doctor, how you could get to the right department site, um, you know, how we could get people to areas of content that especially at that time were almost um, entirely out of our control. And then that started us on the process of improving that content and the pathways. Okay. And Aaron, one last was, question. That, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to just ask on taxonomy, which often comes up. Mm -hmm. uh, 
homemade taxonomy or a modified taxonomy um, with a, more of an open source root? Yep. So, um, so at the time we began with the, the group that was licensing the content, they had a sample taxonomy. We also worked with um, people from the Welch Library, the Welch Medical Library here at Hopkins to get guidance around different approaches to taxonomy. And ultimately at that time we went live with a sort of hybrid. Um, the other thing we did was we let physicians add any kind of medical terms they wanted into their profiles. We reviewed them and vetted them, but it gave us, you know, that perspective kind of organically. Um, and over the years, I mean, we've, we've largely got today, it's completely custom and it's pretty extensive. Um, and we're actually rolling out a new taxonomy, an entirely new taxonomy in about three months. Um, one, yeah. one last question. Um, by a digital content strategist who wants to know, Aaron, how did John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins leaders come around to recognizing how vital that you, your role is? Yeah, so um, it was a very slow journey. I mean, so I've been here about, uh, I've been here over 10 years. And honestly, the first five years, I don't think people really recognized what we were trying to do. Um, ultimately, for us, the, the big things along the way, one was when we really started driving volumes of traffic. Um, there's about a four year stretch where we had at least 50% um, growth every year um, and we kind of you know rose up to being one of those top five visited hospital sites. Um, second way was we really focused on um, physician reputation and those profiles and um, some things that you know I speak to in, inside the organization to support um, you know support them on social media to support things that are being done on rating site and elsewhere and to show that we kind of understand how things have changed for our community of physicians and how we're here to support them and lead the way. Um, so it's taken some time, I think. And now, now we're much closer to really delivering on clear business objectives, which sounds crazy to think that that's really taken 10 years. Um, but I think it also represents a shift for us as an institution where we've shifted from more academic kind of lofty research goals um, to, you know, the expansion of the health system and how do we deliver those, that research broadly across the health system. And that takes some focus on the business. So, you know, ultimately we're able to align with that. Great. Well, thank you, Dave and Aaron, for sharing all of this great information. Um, we want to thank you, the attendees, for contributing your great questions for the Q&A. And a big thank you to Connective DX for sponsoring today's webinar. Um, one final reminder, look for an email with a link to the presentation slides following the webinar. And you'll also receive a link to access the recording as soon as it's been processed and is available for viewing. So thank you for coming and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Good afternoon. Thank you everyone. See ya, thanks.